<laughs> Here we go. It says you're live. I got it now. That spinning was going to just drive me. It was. Now, if it was just sitting there, like I think uh, one time before, it was just a black screen, and I was good. But that spinning on that... Oh, no, no, no. Anyway, let me introduce myself. My name is Glenda Archangel Jones. Good morning, Winnie. And you're with the Matthew 633 C. First Ministry Bible Study, where we study the Word of God. I want to encourage you to get your pads, your pens, your Bible, and be ready to write because God speaks individually and collectively. And so he says, write the vision down that they that read it may run with it. So I want to encourage you, whatever the Lord is telling you today, to write it down. Again, uh, sorry for the delay. I was trying to get YouTube up and at it. But again, thank you all for your giving. I, I don't know what I did with the list, but I did read it, I think, twice. But thank you for your giving. It's because of your giving we're able to give. Also want to thank you for your giving because on Resurrection Sunday, we were able to feed our uh, family over in Pakistan. They uh, requested only one thing for Easter, and that was to have for Easter. Mm -mm for Resurrection Sunday, and that was to have a meal, and to God be the glory for the things he has done. We were able to provide them a meal, and so thank you, thank you, thank you for your giving. Uh, we're not only giving here local, but we're giving all over the world. So when you stand before for the Lord, you and that's one thing <laughs> that the Holy Spirit will attest to that you gave, and so thank you again for your giving. We're able to give to God be the glory for the things he has done. And I'm a firm believer, the more you give, the more he'll give to you. You can't be this given. Even when you don't have it to give, <laughs> he still makes a way out of no way. I don't know how he does it, but I've seen him do it over and over in my life. All righty. So this morning, we're just going to do a review of chapter 18 and then an introduction to chapter 19. So guess what? On Friday, <laughs> thank you for the thumbs up. On Friday, we will be doing the beginning of chapter um, 19. Y'all know I'm always saying that. Why do I always have to start? <laughs> Chapter 19, I mean, not, not any, not chapter 19, but any chapter on a Friday. Let me, let me uh, send this right quick. Okay. Thank y'all for being so patient with me. So patient. God is. Look like everything I have to do right when I'm on. But anyway. So we're going to be starting chapter 19 on Friday. <laughs> and I was like, I can't do nothing else. But I, I mean, and you know what Satan say, oh, just don't go home. And you won't have to start on Friday. You can start on a Monday, but the devil is a lie. All righty. So let's pray. And then we'll get off into a review the last few verses of chapter 18, a little brief introduction of 19. So prayerfully, we might get up early today. You never know what God is doing. <laughs> so let's pray. Father God, here we are before you once again to say thank you for another day God you blessed us with. We are so grateful. It is because of your love. We're able, dear God, to get up and to start a new day a day we have never seen before. I know it looks like the same old mom didn't day, but it's a new day with new grace and new mercies. It's a day we've never seen before. And so we are grateful to be found here in the land of the living and yet the dying another day. And we say, thank you, God. We thank you, Father, that we are in this place to praise and to worship a true and a living God. Thank you, Father that we can bow in your presence and call you Abba Father. Thank you that we have that kind of relationship that you hear and you answer and you do great and mighty things that we know not of. And we say thank you. Thank you for all things, Lord. Oh, how we love you and we magnify you. We worship and adore you. You are God. In the very presence of who you are, you allow us to come and to sup with you, to spend time with you, 
to talk with you and you talk with us and we're grateful. And Father, we're so thankful that you left your Holy Spirit that lives within us, moving and being and having his way within us, dear God. We're so grateful that you left your word with us so that your word will go forth as a two-edged sword out of our mouths, dear Father, that you live and have your being in, over, around, through. God, we are so grateful. Thank you, dear God, for the love that passes all understanding. Thank you, God, that you allow us to have peace, even in a chaotic and a crazy type of world. Thank you, Father, that we have joy unspeakable. Lord, even when things look bad, they feel bad, we still have the joy of the Lord. And we are so grateful. Even as we go out into this sin-sick world, we will remain a light, God, so that men and women, boys and girls, will see the light and know that there is a God. <laughs> He's living and breathing and having his being inside of us. And so we thank you, God. We remember those, Father, that are without this morning, dear God, be it spiritual or physical, financial, emotional, mental or relational. We remember God and we pray even right now that you will be who you are and that is Jehovah Jireh, the God that provides. Father, we realize that you are El Elyon. You are the most high God and we recognize you as that Father. And we thank you, dear God, that even though you sit high, you look low. Father, that you walk the faith of this earth, going to and fro, seeking to save those that are lost. And we say thank you, God. You are such an awesome and a holy, a worthy God to be praised. And we are here to praise you for all that you have done, are doing, and will do in our lives. And Father, we just ask, even as we are reviewing, that the Holy Spirit will continue having his way, speaking to us and through us, dear Father. God, we thank you that we will receive a word for ourselves, even in the Old Testament, the foundational truth, Father, that we will receive a truth for ourselves, and we will go out and live in that truth. And God, we just say thank you. We bless you even right now and we lift you up. We magnify, we adore, we worship, we bow in your presence. God, you are good. <laughs> and we love you, boy. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Good morning, Alanda. Glad to have you this morning. All righty. So uh, we're going to, like I said, we're going to do uh, a little introduction, and then we're going to begin chapter 19. Well, at, no, no, we're going to do uh, conclusion verses of chapter 18, and then we're going to do an introduction to chapter 19, because, good morning, Betty, glad to have you, because on a Friday, <laughs> y'all know, Mm. On Friday, we will begin chapter 19 of the Lord So Spares Life. Again, I want to thank you all uh, for allowing me to have a few days off. It really was a few days of good rest because when I don't come on in the mornings, I literally can spend so much more time in the Lord. So it was really a good time for me. <laughs> so just thank you for allowing me <laughs> to do that. Uh, and again, I pray you had a wonderful resurrection holiday. I pray that you just praise the Lord for allowing his son Jesus to come, to die, and then get up. Conquer sin, death, and the grave. My God, my. let me get out of that. I'm going to go off into that. <laughs> All righty. So if you want to, you can open your Bibles with me. We're really reviewing uh, Genesis chapter 18, and we're on the 30th verse now. So on Wednesday of last week, we finished chapter 18, and our review verses for today will recap the end of chapter 18. Uh, um, yeah, chapter 18. In verse 30, Abraham has boldly questioned whether God's plan to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah is just. You know, Abraham said, now will you, will you destroy the righteous and the wicked together? So he's actually questioning God. 
Abraham is very bold in the presence of God. <laughs> since there might be, Abraham says, since, since there might be some righteous people living there, you're going to destroy the righteous and the wicked, although God is having this conversation. We're going to talk about it with, and we have talked about it with Abraham. And he knows there's no righteous. <laughs> No, not one. And I believe that uh, Lot was a righteous man in Sodom, but he was not living a righteous life. I believe that because of all the things that happened in Lot's life. It lets me know he was not living a righteous life <laughs> in Sodom. Uh, in this context, righteous does not mean moral perfection. Rather, it means those who did not participate in the well-known sins in the city. You know, it's not moral righteousness that we're talking about, perfection, moral perfection. We're talking about those that didn't openly participate in the known sins of the city. You know, like uh, sexuality type sins that the city was known for. But as we will see, everybody in the city was participating. Ezekiel 16, 49 to 50, Genesis 19, which we will start on Friday. Lord spare. God graciously allows a sinful mortal like Abraham to discuss the boundaries of his mercy. Even as Abraham attempts to push God's standards further and further down. And he does because Abraham starts with 50 <laughs> and works his way down to 10. Here, Abraham begs the Lord not to get angry with him. And I would too, the way Abraham was challenging, if you will, that's a good word, God, God. It tells you that God has that kind of a love for us. Mere humans, dirt. And he's standing up there questioning God's integrity, if you will. No, no, his righteousness. <laughs> so here Abraham begs the Lord not to get angry with him. Reading this passage with fresh eyes, knowing nothing else but God or his character as revealed in the scripture, one is likely to be concerned about Abraham's boldness <laughs> simply because the character of God says that I'm a righteous God. That's his character. The character of God says I am a loving God. That's his character. He doesn't stop loving us when, when, he, when we mess up. He still loves us. You know how we are. Somebody make us angry. It's almost like, listen, I don't ever want to see that person again. Don't get in my face. God is not like that. He is love. It's his character. It's who he is. He's righteous. It's who he is. He's just. It's who he is. It's his character. So how can Abraham, mere dirt, stand in the presence of God and judge him as being unfair? Prior to this conversation, God destroyed virtually the entire race of human man in a flood in Genesis 7, because God said, now that's one thing he's loving, but he said, I will not tolerate sin. Sin, I won't tolerate. Now I know you're asking yourself, why are you tolerating me? Because I ain't nothing but a sinful creature because of the blood of Jesus. <laughs> I have the answer. Because of what we just celebrate, what Jesus just did for us, we just celebrated on Sunday. That's why he has not destroyed us. It's not by any righteousness that we have done. None. But it's because of what Jesus did. That's why he hadn't destroyed us yet. <laughs> because of what Jesus did. And that's why I say people ought to fall on their face, ought to be worshiping and pray. The church, you ought to be able to hit a church a block before you get to it. That's how much people should be praising God. All that he's done. 
He has declared his intent to judge the sin in Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis 18, 17 through 21. You remember here, he and Abraham had been talking even before they went to this mountain and looked down on Sodom and Gomorrah. He told Abraham, remember he consulted himself. Oh my God. God talked with himself and said, shall I tell my friend Abraham? And he said, yes, I ought to tell him because this will affect him because he will become the father of these nations. And so he's telling, he already told Abraham, my intent is to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. We know how highly God values human righteousness. And we know what he's capable of when human beings indulge in wickedness. Or oh, we've seen him move because he will not tolerate sin. Good morning, Aquanetta. <laughs> Abraham, however, believes himself to be bargaining for the very life of his nephew Lot and his family, because really that's the way it kind of started off. Abraham was in thinking about Lot is down there in Sodom. I've got to talk to God so God won't do destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. I've got to talk to him. But later on, we find as he continues to talk to the Lord, he is concerned about all of those that may be righteous in Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, let me just tell you, as believers, it's not just about us. We ought to be concerned about others. And that's why I'm always thanking you for your giving and your gifts, because we are concerned about those that are not able to eat like we eat. For those that don't have roof over their heads like we have roof over our heads. For those that don't have clothing to put on, we are concerned about those. For those that are, thank you for the hearts, that are lost and on their way to hell, we're concerned about those. And that's one reason why I get up at four o'clock in the morning to be online, because I'm concerned about those that are lost. I thank God for those that are in the church that are saved, sanctified, set apart unto the Lord. Thank you for the words. I'm so thankful before God. But there are still some. There are still some. And this is where Abraham was. There may be one, Lord. There may be. Which would destroy a city for right there are righteous people in it. And so. God's desire is that none be lost. Our desire to be the same. Everywhere we go, everyone we meet, we need to be a light. We need to say, well, you know, I didn't talk to him, but somebody else. No, be that one that tell him about Jesus Christ. Be that one that will stand in a line and say, hey, I got your groceries for you. Don't worry about it. I don't have but. A, a, a dollar worth of whatever I have in my hand, but I got your groceries. Because we ought to be concerned one for another. And you're going to see the love of Abraham. And, and at first it was all about Lot. It really was. But as he continues to talk with God and plead to God, you begin to see that it is the love of others. So, uh, um, if he can get God to agree to spare the city for the sake of the right number of righteous people, perhaps a lot can be saved from God's judgment. Notice I said perhaps. <laughs> we know the end of the story and he is, but let me just tell you. And that's why as believers, we have to be careful. <laughs> we can stay in one place too long and get comfortable there. You know, like people will go to Vegas and to visit. And like I say, I've been to Vegas myself. And y'all, let me just tell you, <laughs> it made me think of this. I promise I'm going on, but it made me think of this. Me and my younger son, my husband and my older son didn't go. I don't know why, but me and my younger son went. And uh, he was 17 at the time. So this is how long that's been. And we... Uh, our hotel was behind the casino. We had to walk through the casino to get to our hotel. Smoky, smoky. But anyway, we uh, were leaving out. And I said, oh, I forgot whatever I forgot. I don't remember. But I went back to the room to get whatever I got. 
Well, I came back and my 17-year-old is sitting at the slot machine pulling the lever. And y'all won't believe this. And talking with a security guard. He's a minor. Gambling. <laughs> oh, I'm going to jail is all I can think. <laughs> it's all I can think. I'm going to jail. <laughs> so when I saw him, it's just like I stopped a minute. And then I was just like, what do I say? So I said, hello. I spoke to the security guard. I said, hello, sir. How are you? He said, fine. I said, Todd, are you ready? Uh, I'm ready. And so he said, oh, yeah, mom, I'm ready. And so he took his, he got some money. He was the only one that won money because he's the only one gambling. <laughs> he got his little thing and went got his money. And I'm like, Tom, don't you ever sit behind one of the machines again. I'm not going to jail for you. <laughs> he said, oh, I didn't know I couldn't play. You're a minor. Thank God he's six foot six, seven, whatever. <laughs> the man probably thought he was older. Oh, I'm so thankful. And he didn't ask him for an ID or anything. But y'all, anyway, <laughs> that was just my life story. So if he can get God to agree to spare the city for the sake of the right number of righteous people, perhaps a lot can be saved from God's judgment. The Lord has already agreed not to destroy the city if he finds 50. And then he went down to 45 or 40 righteous people there. Now the Lord agrees to 30. Abraham, though, clearly knows how depraved this city is. Remember, I told you he was trying to find righteous out of five cities. He said, if I can find 10 righteous people out of five cities. Genesis 13, 13, Genesis 14, 22 to 23. Uh, because remember the Penta, what is it? A Penta, Pentecost? No, -uh, not Pentecost. Well, anyway, there are five cities that are in it. And Solomon and Gomorrah are the main cities of the five. These were the cities that the four kings went in and took all the spoils, but they only talked about Sodom and Gomorrah, even when the kings went in. But there were five cities that they went and they took all of the spoils. So these are the same five cities that Abraham is trying to find, 50 people, 10 in each city. And that's why he gave the number 50 in the beginning. He said there ought to be 10 righteous in, in, in five cities. There ought to be 10 righteous. And then he thought about it. He says, but Sodom and Gomorrah, I know are the biggest cities or the capital of the cities, if you will, and they are corrupt. So maybe I ought to say 45. Maybe I ought to say 40. Maybe I ought to say 30. <laughs> he understands that 30 might still be more righteous people than the city could offer. So then in verse 31, Abraham believes himself to be negotiating with the Lord, likely for the life of his nephew Lot and Lot's family. Notice I say the word, he believes he is negotiating with God because God already had a plan. He already told Abraham his plan. I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But here he thinks he is negotiating with God. And the reason why he thinks he can negotiate it with God, because he thinks he knows that there are righteous people in the city and God already knows all things. That's why we can't negotiate with him, because he knows all things. He knows that there are not 50 or 40 or 45 or 30 or 20, if you will, or not even 10 righteous in the city. The Lord has revealed that he will investigate the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah and, by implication, bring judgment upon those cities. Lot lives in Sodom. This is not actually a bargaining process, however. God is playing a role of a patient parent. He really is. Allowing a child to talk it out. I don't know about you, but being a parent, you know, when I was growing up, you couldn't talk to your parents because I remember when I try and tell my mama something, she shut up. <laughs> but I said, as a parent, I would allow my, not to say that they wouldn't be punished, but I would allow them to speak. And here we have God allowing Abraham to speak. 
to say what he has to say because God has already made the judgment for Sodom and Gomorrah. But he's allowing him to talk just like you would allow a child to talk in a situation for their own benefit. You know, it's like talk it out, get it all out of your system because after this, I'm going to whip you, but let's just get it all out because that's going to be your punishment. That's going to be the judgment that I placed upon that situation. But I'm going to allow you to have your time to talk. Abraham is going to set the ball for righteousness in Sodom at a pathetically low level, and it is still will not be enough. Now, out of a whole, Sodom and Gomorrah was the Lord's cities of the five cities. And out of five cities, five, I know you just think it's Sodom and Gomorrah, but it's really not. It's the whole five cities he's talking about. <laughs> he can't find 10, I'm holding up five fingers, but 10 righteous. The purpose of, is 633. 6.33, let me stop it before I get into a middle of the statement. For those of you that are Matthew 6.33, God's seekers, you know what we do. For those of you that's new to the page, we set our alarms, our watches, everything we have for 6.33. Because Matthew 6.33 says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And plus, it's a good witnessing tool because somebody going to want to know why your alarm going off. You can tell them, I'm a Matthew 633 God seeker. I've chosen by the act of my will and the aid of the Holy Spirit to seek God's face first. Thank you, Miss Sue. Thank you, Winnie. Thank you, Betty. And thank you, Akunera. And so what it does is that it reminds us to seek God's face first, at least twice a day. Prayerfully, you're seeking his face all day. But at least twice a day, it'll be a reminder, hey, Am I seeking God's face? I need to stop right here and seek his face because we want all things added. Thank you, Patsy, to us. But we have to seek his face first. He tells us how we can get to all things. Seek his face first. All right. Prayerfully, somebody heard that. That's a word in due season. <laughs> so let's pray. And then we get back into the lesson. Father God, here we are before you to say thank you. Thank you for your word because your words are true. They are life. And they are life-giving. And so we say thank you. Thank you, dear God, that you're teaching us, that you allow us to rant and to raid and to go on with things because you love us and because you are Daddy God. You are our Father. And you allow us to do those things. And it doesn't change how much you love us, Father. And we're so grateful that you allow us to speak, to have our say, even though we're wrong every time on every account almost. We thank you for allowing us. And we will just continue to give you the praise as you continue speaking to us through the word. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. I made coffee this morning. I'm really rocking the coffee now, y'all. Watch out. I don't know what I'm doing different, but it's tasting better. Either that <laughs> or become accustomed to bad tasting coffee. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, the purpose of this decision is for our, uh, this discussion, I mean, I'm sorry, is for our understanding. That's the purpose. So that we would see that God is a righteous God, that God loves us enough, allow us to be crazy in his presence and still not strike us dead. And so this conversation went on because one day Abraham who is the father of many nations, will tell generations to generations to come. God already knew that there was none righteous in Sodom and Gomorrah. And yet he allowed me the opportunity to stand in his presence and to try and persuade him that there was one righteous in the city. And so he will tell this, that God is a righteous God. He is a just God. He's a fair God. Because Abraham will now be able to tell that. And because it's written so that we may read it, we understand that God allows us. I don't know why or how he does it, but he allows us to come into his presence raggedy. That's the only word I know to say and still love us beside ourselves. 
because here's what you see. Abraham is telling him he's not a fair God, but he comes to the conclusion that God is a righteous and a just God. So um, the purpose of the discussion is for our understanding why God owes us no explanation. You know, I know how you've said that with parents. You know, I, I know I've said it. Let me not say y'all, but I know I've said it. I don't have to explain myself to you. I said no, and that's the end of that. <laughs> Why? Because I have the authority to say that. God has the authority to do what he does and owes us no explanation because we are his creation. He doesn't have to explain to us. Now, we sometimes have to go before him groveling and saying, Lord, forgive me. But he does not owe us any explanation for what he does, when he does it, and how he does it. Simply because he knows all things. His conversation here gives us insight, which proves his actions against Sodom to be entirely justified. Abraham started by asking if God would spare the city if he found 50 righteous people. There, the Lord agreed. Then Abraham said, what about 45? The Lord agreed. Then 40, then 30. Now Abraham asked for 20 while recognizing that he's being incredibly bold to speak his, this way to God. The Lord again agrees. 20. You'll spare the city. Then in verse 32, after God indicates his intent to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah for their sins, Abraham again tries to convince God to consider the righteous people who might live there. In truth, God already knows that Sodom is doomed and has no need to justify himself to Abraham. However, using human language, he has allowed Abraham to discuss sparing the city if a smaller number of people there are not involved in the city pervasive sins. Genesis 13, 13, Ezekiel 16, 49 to 50. Good morning, Shay. Glad to have you. Abraham concludes his negotiation with the Lord here with another request that the Lord not be angry with him and promise not to push any further after this. He said, Lord, don't be angry with me. And after I give you this number, I promise I'm not going to change it. You should have. <laughs> if the Lord finds, this is Abraham, if the Lord finds 10 righteous people inside him, Will he spare the city for the sake of those 10 people? This particular number was probably Abraham's goal all along with the intent of sparing his nephew Lot from death in the judgment against Sodom. Once more, the Lord agrees to Abraham's request. He will not destroy the city if 10 righteous people are found. Y'all, I think about Lake Charles. We're probably at, like I said, 70 something thousand people here living here now. And if the Lord came, would he find 10 righteous? Would he find 10 righteous? Now, I'm not talking about people that go to church. I'm not talking about people that be in, in church. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm not talking about people that walk the street and say, oh, praise the Lord. Thank the Lord. I'm talking about 10 righteous. That's the ones that sold out. If it came to living or dying, I died for the Lord. 10 righteous in the whole city. This particular number was probably, like I said, Abraham's goal already. Once more, the Lord agrees to Abraham's request. He will not destroy the city if 10 righteous people are found. Of course, the Lord already knows how many righteous people he will find in Sodom and Gomorrah. And like I said, I don't think that Lot was even all that righteous. I just think that the Lord loved Abraham. And because he loved Abraham, he spared Lot. See, because the Lord knows our heart. And I'm telling you, 
uh, when you're in the midst of a righteous person, you can be blessed just by being in their presence. And I truly believe, I don't know this, when we get to heaven, we're going to be able to ask, but I don't know that Lot was all that righteous, but I believe that God knew how much Abraham loved him. Um, of course, the Lord already knows how many righteous people he will find in Sodom and Gomorrah. He knows what's coming. Still, he has been gracious and kind to endure Abraham's pointed questions and requests. In the end, Abraham will know that the Lord is both just in his judgment and merciful in his approach. Because God did not have to tell Abraham anything, but because he wanted Abraham to really know how merciful and how just he is and what a righteous God we serve. He had to have this discussion so that we would know. God didn't just walk in and say, I already see it, which he already knew. But he just didn't walk in and say, I see, I judge, and that's it. He allowed us to know that I have so much grace and so much mercy. If you come before me, I'll hear your plea. And that's what he did with Abraham. Then in our final review verse, verse 33, God has indicated that Sodom will be destroyed for its wickedness. Abraham objects, suggesting that it would be unfair for God to punish righteous people along with those who are wicked and begin to ask God to spare the city for the sake of smaller and smaller number of righteous people. Again, in this context, righteous simply means those who aren't involved in the grievous sins of Sodom and Gomorrah. Genesis 19, which we're going to study, Ezekiel 16, 49 to 50, in a display of great patience, grace, and mercy, the Lord has stood and heard everything Abraham has said to him, including a bold claim about whether or not God's plan is fair. That's a man that is standing in the presence of God and question God. And God has that kind of a love that oversees, I want to say, his ignorance. In addition, the Lord agreed to every request that Abraham, that came from Abraham, even though Abraham turned it into what sounded like a negotiation. Abraham's intent all along was likely to reach the point seen in this last verse of verse 33. God vows not to destroy the city if 10 righteous people could be found there. The point of this is not that God needs to have his mind changed. Rather, the purpose for this conversation is to prove in no uncertain terms that God's approach to these wicked cities is entirely just. That's what he's, God has proven. You can't find them. You won't find 10. As the Lord walks away, likely towards Sodom, and Abraham returns home, the agreement stands that the Lord will not destroy Sodom if he finds 10 righteous people there. Abraham seems to believe or at least hopes <laughs> that at least 10 of Sodom's thousands of residents are not participating in the great wickedness of which they have become infamous for. And we saw that in Genesis 13, 13. Abraham's ultimate hope, we assume, is to save the life of his nephew Lot and his family. Sadly, the next chapter will reveal that Abraham has overestimated the number of righteous people in Sodom. He has also underestimated the extent of the Lord's blessings for him and thus for his extended family. It's the love that the Lord has for Abraham and the love that Abraham has for the Lord that spared Lot 
and his family. God's patient discussion with Abraham allowed Abraham to set his own standard for goodness. You see, we have a standard and God has a standard. We might call it righteous and holy and God says it's stinking in my nostril because our standards is so much lower than God's. By any measure, the city was deserving of God's wrath. Lot, however, will be saved from this wrath despite his own foolishness. Share the video, thumbs up, like, and tag. So here, in a short review of chapter 19, this is one of the most dramatic and shocking chapters in Genesis, which is saying something. The events recorded here reveal the utter wickedness of the people of Sodom. They display God's grace to Abraham in rescuing Lot and his family. I'm just trying to tell you, if one person in a household loves the Lord, the Lord will, he will actually do it, spare the whole family because of the love that one person has for him. I'm trying to tell you. I remember Miles Monroe, I think it was Miles Monroe, who said he was on an airplane and the airplane was having engine problems. And the lady was panicking and he said, don't worry about it. I know he did die from an airplane crash, but this particular time he said, don't worry about it. I'm on the plane and God is sending me to a mission. We're going to make it. <laughs> and they land the plane, not where it was supposed to, but they did get the plane land. Nobody was hurt or injured. The uh, events record here reveal the utter wickedness of the people of Sodom. They display God's grace to Abraham in rescuing Lot and his family. The Lord displays his grace. Um, they show God's readiness and ability to judge the sins of humanity. Don't you just, don't you believe that when God tells Jesus and Jesus splits the skies to come and judge that he's not ready because sin is running rampant in this world and he didn't ever create this world to be with sin in it. And that's why the world doesn't know how to act. That's why we have in all of this erratic, if you will, weather. And the other day I was watching where they were talking about how the fish in the in the waters are just acting just erratic and coming up on dry land and dying. And fish, no, they can't live on dry land. They have to be in water. But they, they had them just spinning around. And they were just swimming in circles and they say they don't know what's going on. Well, that's the type of world that we're living in. When it's supposed to be uh, hot, it's cold. <laughs> when it's supposed to be cold, it's hot. It's supposed to be rain, it's sunshine. So we're having very erratic weather because the earth was never made or created for this type, this amount, if you will, of sin to be rampant in it like it is. And it's affecting not only the atmosphere and the, the uh, trees and the grass, but it's affecting us also because we have diseases that they're renaming and giving names and stuff they don't know what's causing it because of sin. So don't think God won't be ready to judge when he tells Jesus <laughs> that it's time. The display, they display God's grace to Abraham in rescuing Lot and his family. Uh, in this particular scripture, they show God's readiness and ability to judge sin and humanity. And these verses display the lasting consequences of sin in the heart of Lot and his daughter. In the prior chapter, God humors Abraham by discussing the condition which Sodom must meet in order to avoid destruction. While God has no need to justify his actions to anyone, this conversation is permitted for our benefit. By allowing Abraham to set a standard for God's justice, which Sodom objectively fails, <laughs> chapter 18 leaves no doubt that the fate of Sodom is questionably undeserved. In this chapter 19, two angels will come to Sodom and 
to destroy the city. These seem to be the same angels who had been speaking with Abraham in chapter 18. Remember they had uh, a meal. The Lord and two angels had a meal with Abraham and they talked with him even there. Lot greets them at the gates to the city. The two angels went down to the city of Sodom. The Lord stayed and spoke with Abraham about the city of Sodom. But the two angels go down and Lot greets them at the gate of the city. This is in chapter 19 and insists that they stay in his house for the night. Based on what happens in the next few verses, Lot likely knows that traveling strangers will not be safe in the streets. Even inside of Lot's home, however, these strangers are not out of harm's way. The men of the city surround Lot's home and demand the men be sent out so the mob may know them. When I say know them, I don't mean ask their names. The text is clear, both in terms of language and interpretation and context, that a crowd of men from Sodom has gathered to homosexually rape these two strangers. Lot pleads with them. He offers them his virgin daughters instead. Whether this is a symbolic gesture or a Middle Eastern hospitality or an actual solution being purposed by Lot, the men of Sodom will not relent. They want the two men that went into Lot's home. The angels intervene and physically remove Lot and his family from the city. They give clear instructions to Lot and his family to run for the hills and not look back. Lot says, no. And they allow him to go to Zor instead. Remember, Zor is one of the cities out of the five that Abraham was trying to find ten righteous. Then God's judgment falls from falls in the form of sulfur and fire, and God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah, the region around it, all the people and all the vegetation. Lot's wife disobeys, look back, and is turned into a pillar of salt. Lot and his two daughters have been spared, but they have not, they have lost everything. The following morning, Abraham sees the smoke rising from all of the land of the valley as from a furnace. Everything has been utterly destroyed, though Lot and his girls are safe in Zor. Lot is afraid to stay there. He takes, and why is he afraid? Because he knows Zor is corrupt also. Don't let, the, don't let it fool you. <laughs> he takes his daughters and runs for the hills, settling in a cave. It's unclear why Lot didn't run to the household of his uncle Abraham. In one of the scripture's most tragic embarrassment, Lot's daughters, this is all in chapter 19, decided they have lost all hope of ever being married or having children. They take, now this is, his children have been raised, Lot's children have been raised in this corrupt Sodom. <laughs> they take matters into their own hands, reflecting the all but non-existing morality of the sodomite culture in which they were raised and they get their father blindly drunk on two consecutive nights each having sex with him in his stupor both daughters become pregnant and resulting sons become the fathers of the moabite and the ammonite people respectively lot's story so far as the Bible is concerned, ends here in ruin in chapter 19, in ruin, in shame and humiliation. These are the girls that were raised. And that's why I say be careful where you allow your children to go and to stay, your grandchildren. It can have a permanent effect on their lives. Be very careful. Share the video, thumbs up, and like. Let's pray. 
Father God, here we are before you, God, to say thank you. Thank you for another time that we get to spend in your word. Thank you, Father, for the finishing of chapter 18. We're so grateful. And we thank you, Father, for the review of chapter 19. We thank you, Lord, that you're preparing us to be different, to be set apart, to not be like the world, but to be a light in the world until you come and receive us as your own. We are so grateful. We thank you, Father, for all of these Matthew 633 God seekers who have chosen to join us this morning. We pray, dear God, for miracles, signs, and wonders over their lives and that they will see and believe and know that it is God. Whether it be a big miracle or a small one, dear God, you're still working miracles. Every time we breathe in and breathe out, it's a miracle. And so, God, we're grateful to be able to see, to hear, to think, to speak. It's a miracle. And so, God, we're grateful. We're so very, very grateful. And we say thank you. Lord, we bless you and we praise you, love you, and adore you. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. There may be someone who doesn't know Christ as their personal Savior. The saints here are praying for you because they realize somebody prayed for them. So I'm just going to ask you now, if you will, um, just do a Romans 10 and 9 that says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you shall be saved. I'm just asking you to confess this little prayer after me. I ask you if you believe that Jesus came, he lived, he died, he rose, and he's coming again. If you believe that, then just repeat this little prayer after me. The saints are praying for you. Heavenly Father, I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. I'm asking you, Lord, to come into my life. Save me. I believe in the finished work of Jesus. And I thank you that you've heard and you've answered. Thank you. I'm a new creature in Christ. Amen and amen. All righty. If you pray that little prayer with me, the angels are celebrating you. We celebrate you. We celebrate you. As you can see, hearts are going up because we are celebrating you. <laughs> We are celebrating you. We are celebrating you. So we thank you. We thank you for uh, for accepting Christ as your personal Savior. We want to encourage you. We want to encourage you to uh, read your Bible on a daily basis. We want to encourage you to find yourself a good church home where they're teaching and preaching the word of God, literally opening the Bible and teaching and preaching the word of God. We want to encourage you in that. Uh, we also want to encourage you, if you'd like, you can email me at eternallysecureM633 at gmail.com. Um, if you didn't get that, it's on the feed. So I want to encourage you <laughs> to do that. If you like, if you like. All righty. You all be blessed. Have a wonderful time in the Lord. Uh, you might want to start reading chapter 19 because we're going to start chapter 19 of the Lord's Souls Bears on Friday. All right. So you all be blessed. Have your wonderful time in the Lord. And know that I love you with the love of Christ. And guess what? It ain't nothing you can do about it. Absolutely nothing. All righty. We'll see you all on Friday morning if the Lord says the same. Be blessed and continue walking in this light. All righty. Bye, y'all. Bye, y'all. Be blessed.